Next, we're going to discuss the dupe operator. Uh, this allows us to essentially define multiple data items. Um, up to this point, we've defined a single, for example, byte variable or a byte with an array of values in it. The duplicate allows us to define multiple bytes. So in this case, in the top line there, var1 allows us a var1 byte 20 dupe allows us to define 20 different byte values all equal to zero. And you can see a few examples. We have the next one, um, the same thing, except because it's a question mark, they're uninitialized. So this allows us to quickly define many and allocate space for uh, many variables all at once. Next, we're going to talk about, we've talked about byte, which is 8 bits. We're just going to go through the syntax for some of the higher level data types. So a word or an S word is 16 bits. So that essentially, since a character is 8 bits, a word can essentially store two characters. Or a number um, up to the value of 65,535. So for the largest unsigned value would be 65535. So the 0 to 65535 is the range for a word. An S word is a signed 16-bit value, and its value can be negative 32768 to 32767. We again we can do an uninitialized. We can do we can define up to two characters because each character is eight bits of data. And you can see a few other examples there. Next, we've got 32 bits. So this is essentially, we're doubling. We had byte, word, and now dword, which is 32 bit integers. And you can see the way that those are defined. The first example there is we're using hexadecimal because that's the radix at the end. And because there's no sign at the beginning, it's assumed to be unsigned. SD word is signed. You can see the negative sign at the beginning. We can use the dupe option, and we can also define an array just like we can with the others. Next, we have Q word, that's a quad word, and that is a 64 bit value, so again, doubling. The T byte is actually a 10 byte package, not an 8. And then floating type is essentially. 8 byte double precision value for real 8. Real 10 is a 10 byte precision value. Real 4 is a 4 byte precision value. You'll see this term referenced a few times, endian order. It sounds like it's somebody's name. It just means that little endian order means that the data values in memory are stored low to high. The least significant byte is stored at the first address, you can see at the top there. The 78 is the lowest order value, and it's stored at the top, the first memory address. The second memory address, 56, stores the second lowest, and so on. So when we refer to little endian order, we're talking about the data being stored from low to high in terms of the least significant byte is stored at the first memory address and goes from low to high. So we're going to take our add sub ASM file and we're going to add some variables to it using some of the techniques we just learned. In the data segment, the dot data, you can see we've added three new variables. They are dword variables. And dword is a 32-bit number. You can see we're defining the dword variables as hexadecimal in this case. The first one is 1000H, sec and second is 4000H, third one is 200H. Uh, in decimal values, the first one has a value of 32, the second one has a value of 64, and the, second, and the third one has a value of 32. 
Um, so in the main process, you can see the first thing we are doing is we are going to move into the EAX register our first value. So essentially, we're we're going to move a value of six or excuse me, thirty two into the EAX register. The next line we are adding to that register our second value, which is sixty four. So we're adding sixteen to sixty four, which is eighty. So we should see in our debugger we would see the hexadecimal value for 80 in the EAX register after performing this step. Next, we are going to do a subtraction of the third variable, which is 32. So 80 minus 32 is 48. And then we are going to move that value, which is currently stored in EAX, to the final value variable, the D word, which you can see we initialized at the beginning as a question mark, which means it's uninitialized. And so a value of 48 is going to be stored in that final variable value, which is 3000H, 3 times 16 being 48. So not too complicated, but just a little bit more sophistication as we continue to learn about some different data types. We talked about declaring uninitialized data. We can also use a data question mark directive to define a segment where the variables in that segment are uninitialized. If you recall, each time we define a variable, the memory for that variable is going to be allocated and it's going to end up as part of the executable size. If we include uninitialized data segments, those do not, those are not pre-allocated in the size of the executable. The memory locations are going to be defined at runtime when the programs actually run. And that's actually somewhat common in higher level languages to do that sort of thing. So if we want to do that in assembly, that is how we do it. Next, we're going to introduce something that you're very familiar with, and that is the equal sign directive. And it essentially allows us to associate a symbol with an integer. So in this example, we are associating a symbol count with an integer 500. Then we are referencing that symbol, that variable, later in our move statement when we're moving to the AX area, the count symbol. Now, up till now, we've actually been explicitly referencing numbers in the code. But as we all know, it's helpful to use the equal sign because it allows us to manage code later because we could easily change that value to another value, another input value, say 600, and without having to actually explicitly update the code in all the places where that number is referenced. We just update the symbol. As far as calculating the size of arrays and strings, we define the byte array in this example, and we use the dollar sign uh, directive. And it is going to essentially allow us to see the length of that array or string. So the subtraction there is we are subtracting the offset, which sometimes is zero, but essentially we find the end point and the beginning point, we subtract those, and that is going to give us the number uh, uh, of bytes in that array. For the others, it's going to be the same process. We are just going to, because we're asking for bytes, we are going to divide it by two for the word, which is 16 bytes. We're going to divide by four for the D word, which is 32 bytes. Next, we've got the EQU directive. And that is similar to what we talked about earlier, but it's used for constants. And it is something that's not going to change, typically. It's useful when we're defining a value that doesn't evaluate to an integer, which the equal sign needs to. Remember, it's a 32-bit integer. 
for example, if we need to define pi in our, or some real number, decimal number, we can use the EQU directive rather than the equal sign directive. And it basically behaves the same way as the equal sign, except it can be applied to non-integer values. Next, we have the text EQ directive, similar to the EQU directive. Uh, it's also called a text macro, and it actually allows us to, I guess you might think of it as an ability to assemble strings, but in a data type. Um, we can either assign text explicitly, or we can actually assign an, an old text macro to a new one. Um, or we can assign a constant integer expression to it. So in this example, we've got the row size of five. Um, and then we are going to prompt the user with a, with a string. Their response is actually going to be placed into the count variable. And then that count variable is actually going to be moved using the move expression um, into the setup AL variable. So it's actually a little bit, of, you might think of it as a macro. We can actually execute almost like a mini program inside of a text EQ directive. Finally, we're going to talk about 64-bit programming. It's very similar. Most of the things we've learned at 32-bit apply. There's going to be a few headers that are going to be not used any longer. Invoke, model, 386 stack, some, some headers that you've seen at the top of your programs are not used. So we'll talk through that for a bit. So the 386 model flat STD call stack 4096 are not used in 64-bit. Invoke is not supported. So if our 64-bit code in a lot of ways is going to look similar and in simpler than our 32-bit. The execution of our code is going to be very similar, but it's not going to have some of the same headers. So a quick summary here of what we talked about. We've talked about integer expressions, characters, how to define all these different data types. We talked about directives that are interpreted by the assembler. We talked about instructions, which execute at runtime. We looked at our different segments of our code, our code segment, data segment, stack segment. We looked at some different types of files, specifically the source files and listing files, the object files created by the assembler, and you know, the linked and then the executable file, which has been linked. We looked at the different data definition directives. And we looked at a few symbolic constants. So that really concludes the sort of overall conversation for chapter three. Good luck to you. And again, as I mentioned earlier, be feel free to come back and use this as reference material because a lot of the stuff we talk about here is foundational for our knowledge of assembly as we continue throughout the course. Thanks a lot.